G'day, Matt Scott here with another very rambly, sweary tutorial, if you can call it that. Um, everyone loves, everyone loves a bit of resolve. Everyone loves a bit of tutorial. So let's give the people what they want. But before we do, let's have a look at um, what I get into in my spare time, because you know, let's let's get to know each other. So <laughs> when I'm not grading and shooting, um, I like nature and wildlife so I go out and I use my 300 mil Canon FD lens from the 80s beautiful lens and I just go and shoot birds it's mad fun you get to see shit like this which is really cool imagine finding that you just see these chicks screaming for their mom the mom's like who the fuck are you stay away from my kids sort of thing anyway it's just nice to sort of mingle with nature because it just sort of helps remind me that you know that's what's important. Facebook isn't important. Instagram isn't important. I know I harp on about this every single time I make a tutorial, but it's true. Yeah, and like this is just a personal issue of mine. Anyway, yes, yeah, so this is what I do. I go out like this is a great example. You're out there and you're shooting birds and stuff, and then you learn that this bird, um, this fantail cuckoo or some sort of cuckoo, I think it is, has what it's done. This guy's mum actually went to this guy's nest, which is not a cuckoo, as you can see, kicked that bird's eggs out of the nest, just kicked them out, killed them, put its own eggs in that bird's nest, and then that bird raised these chicks that aren't even hers or his, and um, feeds them. And look at this! Like, that's nature for you, that's fucked up. <laughs> but it's still interesting, fascinating, and I'm um, really cool to be able to see that in action. And like when you're shooting with a manual lens, it's just like exciting to actually get something in focus. And um, yeah, and like you might see like a possum just sleeping in a tree. And it just helps you realize that like this is more important than money and fame and all that sort of shit. And um, but then, you know, you get back to work and you start getting into the grind of things and you need to pay bills and shit, right? So then you think, well, fuck the birds, I need to make some cash. Um, anyway, let's get back to uh, what I was going to talk about with this tutorial. And um, um, the footage that we're going to be looking at today was shot with this camera. And this is my mad epic rig that I've been building over the last few months. You know, I wanted a rig that was well balanced. I want it to feel like a proper camera. Like, you know what I mean? I've got my Red Scarlet X, which I would consider a proper camera in terms that you can drop it, you can kick it, it's still going to survive. And you can rig it up so it's nice and sort of heavy because you want something sort of heavy to balance on your shoulder and give it that handheld sort of nice looking vibe. Um, so what I've done is built this sick rig which sort of collapses very quickly into like cine saddle mode, um, adventure mode, shoulder rig mode, straight onto the tripod and even strips right down to gimbal mode all very quickly. All this stuff costs money. Goddamn money. Anyway, this camera is fucking sick. Everyone knows that I love it. Um, I mostly just love it because it's really cheap and you know, it's really cheap. I don't have a lot of money. Anyway, so check me out on Instagram. Not because I want followers, maybe I do, but just because I like to showcase my work and when I see likes, it makes me feel happy. So go ahead and help me feel happy. Anyway, what we're gonna have a look at today in DaVinci Resolve is actually how I use LUTs and how I sort of reverse engineer a LUT. Is that a bit bold to say something like that? But basically having a look at what a LUT is actually doing to an image and then choosing whether or not you want the luminance component or the color component of that LUT. And just a couple of things I've been playing with. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have this footage, um, I'm gonna upload it to my blog. Uh, if you haven't seen my blog, go and check it out, matscottvisuals.com. Um, and under the download section, there'll be a whole bunch of clips you can download. And I'm gonna add a couple more here. So there'll be um, the footage from what I'm using today. And that footage is of my beautiful wife, um, so what we're going to do here is just I'm um, just going to add these into the media pool and you'll see that they come in at 50 frames per second I actually shot this at 60 frames per second um, nonetheless when you import this footage uh, DaVinci will ask you do you want to change the timeline settings to match your footage and make sure you say no because we don't want this to be 50p we want to right click on those highlighted clips and go to clip attributes and change them to 2398 23976 just to match our project settings which are indeed 23976. Um, the other thing I just want to point out as well is the image scaling. I always have it set to the maximum quality, which is smoother. 
on for anti-alias edging and use smoother filter and high. And then I usually do scale full frame with a crop only because sometimes I'll do 1920 by 800, 2.4 to 1 aspect ratio, blah, 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 blah. We're not going to do that today, but here we go. So, we've got a timeline, we've got our three clips, and they're all going to be playing back at that beautiful 60p slow mode down to 2398, which looks fucking awesome. Look at it. It's just beautiful. Um, and just in case you're wondering, shot this at 400 ISO with the speed booster specifically designed for the pocket cinema camera. Um, also got the mad raw light filter, OLPF, so if you just go to um, Google, type raw light, first thing that comes up is this. Hans, the guy who invented this uh, particular OLPF, optical low pass filter, it's not a filter that goes in front of the lens, it goes behind the lens, it sits right in front of the sensor and it replaces the OLPF that came with the camera. So what does it do? It gets rid of that moiré pattern. As you can see, no moiré, moiré, no moiré, moiré. And it fixes infrared contamination issues um, like this. So you can see how this has got a pink sort of cast to it. Whenever you put ND filtration in front of a Blackmagic cinema camera, pretty much of any kind, I think, um, you start getting a lot of infrared contamination. Go ahead and check out my blog. I've written a whole article about that um, if you want to learn more about it. But anyway, this is also in my camera. I highly recommend it. It's fucking awesome. And I've already gone off track, but the point is, I'm shooting 60p, 400 ISO. I've got the raw light filter in, and I'm shooting three to one raw. And yeah, beautiful results. So I'm going to upload these clips to the blog. Maybe not the entire clips, but just sort of the best parts. So I've got my beautiful wife here, and she just, I'm sort of directing her now. I'm like, okay, honey, look up. <laughs> just a little bit higher. I think she looks a bit higher. Anyway, you get the point. I'm going to upload this stuff. And what we're going to have a look at is how I graded it. And, um, and having a look at sort of this LUT reverse engineering shit that I was talking about. So we brought it in, we've changed it to 2398, beautiful. We need a timeline as well, so you can highlight those, right click, new timeline using selected clips and call this 60p madness. And then go ahead and press OK, control minus to zoom in and out. So we've got these clips on the timeline, beautiful. And then we go to the color tab. And um, let's just have a quick look at what everyone already knows how to do. So we've got this clip here. And what we're going to do is we're going to right click and we're going to go 3D LUT and we're going to use these LUTs that come with Resolve. This one, for example, changes a log image to a Rec. 709 image and it uses a Fujifilm emulation LUT. And D55 just um, refers to the white balance of the film stock, which was Daylight 55. I think that's what that means. I could be wrong. Anyway, so I do that and then we get this bluey green um, image. So a few things have happened to this shot. If we control D that on and off, um, you can see one, the LUT has not only changed the color, uh, it has also increased contrast. So you can see the highlights have gone up and the shadows have gone down and the saturation, if we go and have a look at the vector scope, the saturation has increased, but not only that, the colors have changed. So it's gone from sort of like a warmy color to a green color, especially in the shadows. And you can also see when we have a look at the waveform that the highlights here being white are now sort of scattered and a bit warmer. They've got red in them. Same with the shadows. I'm oh, sorry, blue in them. And same with the shadows. As you can see, the shadows are more greeny blue. And you can see that here because we're missing green and blue in our waveform monitor. Okay, so that's all cool, but what I wanted to show you is I want to see more accurately what exactly this LUT is doing and um, let's go ahead and have a look at that. So I want you to open up your favorite NLE and in this case for me that's Eddie so I'm going to go new clip and don't use Resolve. I mean I just edited a film in Resolve and it's just fucked. Like it's okay. It can work. This sure as hell is not the world's most advanced editor. Come on guys. Um, <laughs> so open up a real editor and now what we're going to do is go new clip and I'm going to choose color bars and we're going to choose a special color bar and we're going to go ahead and press OK and this is what a special color bar looks like. We drag that down the timeline, it's got some tone and it shows us a range of black to white, white and it shows us um, some colors as well. So we have a look on our scope, um, you can see that we have some interesting information here. We've got zero representing pure black, 100 representing pure white, and we've got this line that shows a gradual, perfect graduation between those two, 
And that's exactly what this gradient is here. And um, just to prove that to you, what I'll do is I'll just go, uh, I'll click on my color bars, I'll go to my crop, and I'm just gonna crop everything out except that lower section. And then you can see, precisely, that's exactly what that is. In a luminance range, that's perfect between black and white. Okay, so that makes sense, cool. Let's go back to our layout and let's open this one, have a look at this one. And as you can see here, here's the exact steps. Each section of gray, beautiful, makes sense. And uh, let's just keep going here and have a look at some color values. Go ahead and press OK. And you can see the color is also plotted here. And color has brightness values. Isn't that interesting? So the blue is the darkest color here. It has the, the weakest luminance value of all these colors where white, uh, sorry, yellow has the brightest and cyan as well. And a bit of magenta here as well. These have equally bright values. So anyway, this is just us learning to um, read a waveform monitor in a vector scope, which you guys probably already know how to do it, but I just thought it's fascinating to actually see it on a standardized um, color bar to see this stuff in action. You can also see these dots here on our scopes that represent, you know, blue, magenta, red. You can see those tiny dots there. Cool. So what we want to do is um, we want to export this and bring it into Resolve. And you might be thinking, well, why don't I just go into Resolve and just generate that stuff in Resolve. Well, because Resolve's a bit of a dick and it doesn't allow you, so like here's a color bar, for example. You can put that on here. Um, and even if it did have a special one, for example, it doesn't allow me to actually add a color effect to that clip. So it's kind of useless for what I want to do. So we'll go back to our NLE and we're gonna save a still image of that. And because I know what humans are like, no one's gonna actually do this. They're gonna be like, can you please give us a link to that so I can just download it? Of course I can. I'll put that up on the blog as well. So um, we right click on this, go to properties. It's only gonna be 8-bit, uh, whatever. So we're gonna 8-bit Photoshop file here. And what I'm gonna do is just to have a look and see where that has been saved. So here it is here. And I'm just gonna uh, copy and paste it into the Laura book folder and rename that as special stuff. Cool. We can close our NLE and we can come back to resolve, go to our media tab, and let's go ahead, bring that special stuff into our bin and then bring the special stuff onto our timeline. And let's just extend that out a bit as well. Cool. So we've got our special stuff clip on the timeline. And as you can see, we have a very similar situation that we saw in um, EDIUS. But this is actually in a 10-bit color space now. So what's interesting about that is um, that zero is not pure black and 1023 is not pure white. Well, it is in a 10-bit color space, but this is 8-bit. Interesting to know. Anyway, we can also have a quick look at our vector scope as well. And it shows us this time a trace between each point, which makes it a little bit easier to see. Don't be confused by this line here, which is the skin tone line. We can always turn that off um, just to help things make it look a bit easier. But anyway, so here we have our red, magenta, our blue, cyan, green, and yellows, and a few variations in between. Very, very cool stuff. In the middle, we have pure gray or pure white, completely no saturation. Right. So you can see where I'm probably going with this stuff. Um, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna add a LUT to this. I mean, it's all very well and good to add a LUT to this and go, oh yeah, I can see the shadows are bluer, I can see my highlights have changed. But if you add it to this, it's far more telling and interesting to actually study what the LUT is doing. So right click, 3D LUT and film look and Rec 79 Fuji, blah, 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 we'll do that one. Cool. So now let's have a look at what's going on. Let's control D. We're not even gonna look at the scopes just yet. We're just gonna look at this with our eyes. We can turn it on and off. So here is the original neutral colors and here is what the LUT is doing. Isn't that interesting? Have a look at the saturation and the brightness values of the greens. They just drop. Isn't that cool? And look at the yellows. They go super saturated and they've got more of an orange tint to them. That's interesting. And have a look at our highlights down here on this gradient. Our highlights go warm. Isn't that interesting? And what happens to our midtones? They roughly stay the same, I would say. A little bit warmer though, a little bit warmer. Another thing I'm noticing is some posterization. Well, not posterization, banding. No one likes banding, do they? So we've got an 8-bit PSD file um, in a 10-bit space. We've added a lot, 
and you can actually see banding here. That's a bit scary, but it's also very telling, very interesting. This is a great way to study what a LUT is doing. So if you've downloaded someone's LUT that they've made, um, some free LUT, even some paid for LUTs, you can actually see what the fuck is going on with these bad boys. You can see what they're doing to each one of these colors, and you can also see what they're doing to our shadows. This is interesting. So here we have a range between black and white. And when we add our LUT, obviously we've added more contrast, and the difference between the highlights, as you can see here, which is very distinguishable, as soon as we add the LUT, add contrast, it sort of blends into one. Now this might be nice for highlight roll-off. That's what cinematographers love. To, they love that word. I mean, I am a cinematographer, but I try not to use words like organic, roll-off, clinical. Oh, it just makes you sound like a wanker, I reckon. Anyway, and down here in the shadows, similar things happening. We've got a nice sort of, we've crushed our shadows, um, but we've got a nice sort of graduation now instead of a stepped look. But all I'm trying to say is, regardless of how I'm describing this, we can see what is going on. Very cool. Let's have a look quickly at another LUT now. This time I'm going to have a look at a teal orange look LUT that I purchased. Um, this one's made by Kino LUT. I'm going to go Kino LUT. I'm going to put it on a Rec 709 image, because that's what this um, still image is. And I'm just going to use the standard and check it out. This is awesome. So here we have a teal orange uh, LUT. Now it's a very extreme, very Hollywood, dare I say, teal orange look like you know Mission Impossible 3 style and um, check it out so our, we've got some posterization and some banding here interesting now not just banding is in like these very um, rigid lines I can also see this sort of wavy band of blue coming in and out here that's interesting in the midtones and down here in the shadows as well so it's interesting to see what this light is actually doing um, and the other telltale signs are obvious Skin tones, what color are skin tones? Red, magenta, and yellow. What does this LUT do to red, magenta, and yellow? Sort of makes reds go orange, that makes sense. It makes magentas sort of dull and pink, and it makes yellows also dull and closer to orange. So there your skin tones, sort of bringing them all closer together into a more terracotta look, and that's exactly what the teal orange look is all about. And then the rest of things turn teal, <laughs> as you would imagine. So here we have our um, cyans and greens and they go into a very teal-ish color as do the blues here our strong blues they're sort of being desaturated and you can see here in the mid-tones what's happening and you'll also notice which is very um, interesting and I, I think important when creating a teal orange look is that your mids or upper mids actually don't really get affected isn't that interesting so that way we've still got some neutral um, ness alive in our image have a look at the highlights, they go blue. Have a look at our shadows, very, very teal. And another interesting point, our blacks are mostly black. Very important. So, pretty cool to analyze that teal orange LUT. So, um, remember I was talking about that sort of wavy uh, look that I can see here. I'm not sure if you can see it on YouTube, but check it out down here. You can actually see that on our scopes. This is what's so sick about actually analyzing a LUT on scopes. Can we have a look at our scopes please? Let's have a look at some bigger scopes. Now this isn't very useful right now other than showing us that we can split and have a look at say for example what's happening to the red channel. Well the red channel is being dropped and manipulated. Now what happens when you get a red channel and you pull it away from the center? It goes blue. Let me just um, give you an example of that. So if I go to this clip here, and right, I just reset this, and I'm just going to very quickly give it some saturation and some contrast. And I'm also just going to warm it up a bit. Right. Okay, so here we have our curves as standard. Now, as standard, our curves are all linked together. Um, let's just quickly go over what these curves mean. Y represents luminance, and RGB represents um, our color channels. As you probably have read or heard, that Da Vinci works in a Y RGB color space. Now this is cool because you can unlink them, and you can say, hey, I just want to affect the luminance. Now this is not going to play with your color channels. As you can see, my red is still here, my green is still here, and my blue is unaffected. Now when you normally use your curves, and they're all linked together, 
all of your channels are affected. So saturation and luminance values of each one of those color channels is increased or decreased. Now when that happens equally, you don't get a color shift. When it happens not equally, for example, the red channel, if I was to pull red away, the image starts to go blue. And as you know how curves work, if I was to pull red only in the shadows, pull red away, you'll notice that our shadows go blue. Now what if we were to increase red, so push that up, everything goes red. So up increases and down decreases. So how do you know what color things are gonna turn when you decrease a color channel? Well, it's the opposite color. So the opposite color of red is blue, which means if we take red away, we get blue. Green, if we push more green in, it goes green. If we pull green away, it goes magenta. Opposite color of green is magenta. This must be boring for a lot of people right now. Who cares? So we've got blue, up is blue, and down is green. Green and yellow. Now, um, sometimes I'll use this where I'm like, actually just want to make the highlights a little more yellow. I'll lock off my mids and just pull a bit of blue out, and it just warms up my highlights. Anyway, there's a little crash course on curves and what's going on. And if we go back to our example and have a look at our waveform, you can actually split and have a look at, let's have a look at some bigger ones. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you can actually tell eventually, hey, I only want to look at what's happening to the Luma channel. This is what's happening to the Luma channel. If we turn our LUT off, perfect graduation between black and white, turn our LUT on, and we have this wacky Luma channel con um, contrast curve. Now, I'm not interested so much in the Luma channel right now because when we're analyzing a light, I want to see what's happening to the red channel. We turn that on. Wow. Check it out. Look at this wavy shit. And that's where those wavy bands are coming in. Not sure why that was sort of built into this LUT. Not sure how this LUT was created. I dare say it was not created in Resolve though, using curves. Because how the fuck would you make that curve in Resolve? I don't think you even can. Let's have a look at the green channel. Nowhere near as manipulated. Um, and the blue channel, similar. It's the red channel, and that's because, remember, teal is a bluey color, which is the opposite of red. You get the idea. So when you're looking just at the wire component, you can see the contrast curve that's built into this. Now, the reason I think this is interesting is because sometimes, right, I'll grade a shot, like just say I'm really happy with this, but I'm not really happy with the colors that come straight out of the box from my Blackmagic micro cinema camera, for example. So here we are, and uh, we graded this shot, and you know we're just going to add a couple more components here. I'm just going to brighten this side of the screen up. All right, and just warm it up a bit. Actually, you know what? Let's do what I was just saying. I do, and go to the blue channel, and just warm it up a little bit like that. Yeah, if I can see. So here we have our grade, and maybe we've graded all of these shots like this as well. So now I've got this whole scene done and what I want to do now though is I kind of want to add a look to this entire scene and I want to use a LUT. But the LUT that comes with Resolve for maybe a film look, the one I'm talking about, so for example if I was to go Shift S and add a node before this, right click and go 3D LUT, film looks and add this LUT, the problem is that this LUT has contrast built into it. So not only, it's sort of doubling up the contrast and that looks shit, right? So I've already done my contrast, I've already graded and balanced my scene and now all I want to do is emulate this film stock in terms of its color only. I don't want the luminance to come through. So how would you go about doing that? Well, as I was mucking around with this and learning about what this, um, all this stuff, shit's doing, I'm gonna go 3D light, I'm gonna go film looks, I'm going to go Rec. 709 Fujifilm 351DI D55 and I'm going to add that LUT. So here we go. Here's the original. Here's what the LUT's doing. Let's bring up our scopes and this time let's turn off R, G and B. So we're only monitoring the luminance component of this. Now, what I want to do is actually inverse that curve. So how do we go about doing that? Well, what we want to do is we want to add a LUT, um, add what we want to do, actually, is um, start fucking around with our curve to inverse this curve. And I'll show you what I mean. If I go down here and push this up, and push it up again, push it up again, push this down, 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 you can see what's happening to this curve. 
And if I was to muck around with this enough, I reckon I could get this line perfectly straight. And if I could get that line perfectly straight, that means that I'm actually taking away any luminance values that have been added to this LUT. Okay, so I'm doing this um, very crappy at the moment, you can see, I'm not doing it very accurately. But we're going to show you how to do it very accurately in a second. So what I've done is we control D this on and off. All I'm doing is messing with the colors, not messing with the contrast. And we're going to do this properly in a second. So you get the idea, right? But what I really need is a straight line to help guide me through this um, D Luma transformation. So how are we going to go and do that? Well, let's go back to our Edit tab. Let's click Alt Drag and create a duplicate of this. Then we're going to go here and we're going to click the crop function and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to drag this down like this and halfway in between this thing I'm just going to crop this out so we're only seeing inside of here on the top layer let's go back to our color tab and on the second layer the one I just made a crop for I'm just going to reset all grades and nose so now you can see that I have this very straight line here which is only showing through this layer here. Making sense? Now what that has helped us done is if you have a look at our scope, not only do we have the contrast curve that's built into that LUT, but we also have this straight line that's going to help guide us with extracting that luminance. So now we go to our clip that has the LUT on it, right? and we go to our YRGB. Now there's two ways you can do this. You can actually unlink and only de-luma using the luma, which kind of makes sense but I find that if you do it this way then you always have to add saturation later on and I prefer to let the LUT add saturation the saturation that's built into the LUT so I'd leave them linked now as you can see we've got some guide and we'll just again let's just start doing this it's a little bit of to and fro so you like add one here push the next one down add one here, push the next one down, and then you'll have to go back. And you want to get it as accurate as possible because you want basically a 0% no shift in contrast whatsoever. Bored yet? How boring is it watching someone do this? Should I just speed it up? I just can't be fucked doing all that, making the tutorials fancy. You know what I mean? And like, I'm offering this for free, so what do you want? <laughs> anyway, here we have pretty accurate delumified LUT, and we can just check that. Let's just fuck this one off. Whoops. Fuck. Oh. Okay, I'm actually going to stop it. Okay, so we're back. And I recreated this a little bit more accurately, I think, this time. Um, the point is, what we can do now is we can right click and, sorry, we can right click over here and grab a still. And that's going to save this uh, delumified LUT in our stills folder. If I right click on that now, call this Fuji blah blah chroma only. So now we have this um, still which is, lives in this project only. But why don't you pop it in your power grade? And now it doesn't matter what project you're in, you'll always have this. Fuji blah blah chroma only and you can see I've got a couple of others here I've got the Sony colors only um, a few others Ari colors blah 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 so it's a really cool way to create a look or a blanket look over an entire scene so I'll show you what I mean by that so we can go here and we can delete these and what I want to do is go to the timeline nodes now create an actual node and then I can just go down here and just drag that onto this node and check it out no 
chrome, uh, no luminance channels or luminance movements, just color and saturation. Isn't that fascinating? Now, of course, um, color channels have their own variation of luminance anyway, as we saw when we were studying those uh, scopes before. So you can see it does shift slightly, and you can see my blacks are a bit fucked as well. But my point is that you can sort of completely transform your scene. All right, we can go back to our clips now, and each one of these has the Fuji color only. But have a look at this. What the fuck is that? This sucks. I think that's just me doing some crappy processing. It's got nothing to do with my LUT. Because you can see even without the LUT, you turn that off. Oh no, it is fucked. Oh, this is interesting, isn't it? This sucks. Is it because I'm using optimized media? Haha, <laughs> pretty much. Uh, what else is it? Let's just quickly check our camera raw settings. Make sure Cinema DNG is full res, which it is. What's going on here? Why is it all jaggy like that? Anyway, something odd is happening. Proxy mode off. Delete optimized media. Maybe that's it. That's fucked. Anyway, experiment with that. Hopefully this was useful. What a, a shitty way to end a tutorial. But yeah, I'll have the uh, clips for you to download at the blog. Make sure you check that out and just maybe check this uh, result. This is sort of how I like the grade. I graded it like this. Didn't really do anything that special. Just put a little bit of sharpness. I tracked the eye. A little bit of sharpness on the eye. Um, raised the shadows a little bit. And I did, you know, brighten up the top right hand corner of the screen a little bit. Um, the point is, there is no point. Just uh, have a great day. Bye. <laughs>